Hello and good afternoon or good morning to you all wherever you are listening from. My name is Paula Gonzalez and I am the Senior Manager of Membership Growth for AAPA. Welcome to AAPA's fifth member-hosted webinar of 2021. Last year, AAPA added a new benefit for new members to allow them to hold a webinar to present themselves to the members and showcase their expertise and thought leadership. So we are very excited to hear what this new member, Industrial Defender, has to share with us today. If you are listening today and you are not a member and you would like an opportunity to present a webinar as a new member, as well as other opportunities to get in front of and build relationships with our port members, I will be sharing my contact information at the end of this presentation. We have lots of exciting programs planned for 2021 and we are resuming in-person events very shortly. So if you are keen to learn about additional opportunities to connect and learn, um, please hang around for just a few minutes at the end of this presentation as I will be sharing um, some additional ways that you can engage, learn, and connect in 2021 through AAPA. But now we'll go ahead and get started. I am pleased to welcome one of our newer members and the presenters of today's webinar, um, Industrial Defender. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Pete Lund to introduce himself and his other speakers. Pete, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, so, as mentioned, uh, we're a new member to um, the group, uh, so happy to be here. I head of product management uh, at Industrial Defender. Uh, Industrial Defender's been kind of leading the charge on securing critical infrastructure and OT uh, for the last decade or so. And, and with recent events, we find ourselves well positioned to help uh, uh, the port sector. Um, prior to uh, Industrial Defender, I actually did spend some time at KVH Industries working on uh, mobile satellite communications for uh, marine and aeronautical. So I'm kind of positioned very well to kind of understand both spaces. Uh, with me is uh, Scott Dickerson. Hi, thanks, Mayor. Thanks for inviting me to join you today as well. Um, I'm Scott Dickerson, the Executive Director for the Maritime Transportation System Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And we're happy to present together here with Industrial Defender, um, to the AAPA audience. Uh, we've done some other presentations for AAPA in the past and very happy to partner with, with everybody and helping to improve the knowledge of uh, the maritime community. Um, have quite a bit of background in Intel, info sharing and cybersecurity, um, particularly in the maritime sector. And so happy to present today with, uh, with Peter on this and can go to the next slide. This is a little bit about what we'll be covering today. I think um, both of us, if anybody has any questions as we go along, feel free to raise those. We'd be happy to answer those. Um, I don't think we feel like there's a need to wait to the end for, for a Q&A session. Please raise those as, as we cover any one of these topics. Happy to answer those as best we can. Thanks, next slide. And so as we get going here, we're going to start off with a quick poll real quick um, and, and try to get your thoughts on some things and then, then we'll dive into this. So the first poll question, if you could please answer this. And I think based on what folks see out in both within their organizations and then what might be seen in the press and what might be seen um, coming out from the government, there's there's a number of things and challenges that folks might be concerned, concerned with. And depending on what your role is within an organization, certainly that's going to influence which challenges might be top of mind for you. Um, but I think as, as we'll talk about, all of these things are, are potential challenges that stakeholders are dealing with um, in the maritime community and are going to be dealing with for a while. And it's where do you find the balance? How do you prioritize? And so we'll talk about some of those things um, today. And I'm not seeing the results there, Paula. So. 
Yeah, I saw that it uh, came up, but I haven't seen the results. So we could probably uh, probably close it. I think we've been up long enough. Okay, I, I'm I'm not sure if you'll see the results when I close it, but I can tell you, 61% have said external threat actors, 18% um, said insiders, and 15% said standards and compliance, and 6% said governance overreach. Okay, so Perfect. we'll talk about some of those things. And I thought that perhaps the external threat actors, those are what get the news, right? Um, those are the headlines. Those are some of the quote unquote scary things. Perfect. Thank you, Paula, for sharing uh, those findings. And so we're going to talk through these. And when we talk specifically the cyber threat landscape, we're not going to get into a whole lot of details on specific threat actors. But I think in general, it's very helpful when you think of threat actors and categorizing them perhaps by what their motivations are and objectives because they're the specific tactics techniques and procedures that they use to try to compromise organizations those change um, as different cybersecurity tools and techniques get put into place on the defensive side they still want to overcome and and it's ultimately the objectives that they're trying to reach right and what's motivating them that's going to keep them coming after you um, and so again, I think some of the threat actors, whether it's state level, um, advanced persistent threats, APTs, whether it's criminals, insiders, activists, um, all of these can potentially severely impact maritime organizations. We've seen uh, heavy activity over the last uh, year and a half or so since COVID kicked off. Just the, the attack rates have and campaign levels have, have just intensified over time and we're seeing again based on motivations there's there's a lot of different things but one of the things is definitely grabbing a lot of people's attention a lot of headlines is definitely ransomware and that has been definitely a growing challenge um, so that financial aspect of a motivational factor um, is there but that doesn't mean that as we had more and more integrated technologies and so many dependencies in the supply chains um, there's potentials for smuggling, and that, that's been going on for, for centuries, really, right? Um, and But now it's more leveraging technologies to help with those activities. And then you have some of the other motivational factors there. And one of the things that um, was very interesting to, to see reported on by actually uh, Verizon in one of the studies that they did was some of that state-level espionage activity that's going on and is often very difficult to detect. Um, about 90% of that activity, the initial compromise takes place via phishing. Um, but then if you haven't picked up on that on that phish and that compromise and that has taken hold, they're, they're not real noisy and they're not necessarily going to show themselves like a ransomware actor that is going to come off and eventually show you that you've been compromised by providing the notification. Right. And so some of those motivations, they might get that data and information. They might stay relatively dormant um, within the environment for quite a long time. So it becomes how do you tune your environment and, and how are you developing defense in depth strategies to counter this? Um, and I think based on the, the poll results, yeah, it's, it's definitely external and then insiders right after that of. And it's not necessarily a malicious insider. Um, a lot of the incidents that we see take place within the maritime sector are the non-malicious insider that is really just trying to get their job done and might click on that file, might click on a link, might do something um, to impact the availability of a critical system and take that offline, et cetera. Um, and they might just be trying to do their job and, and something doesn't happen how they thought it was going to happen. Um, so I think that is definitely, don't just focus on the revenge aspect of an insider, but think of those unintentional. And that plays a big role then in security awareness training and all that, we'll, we'll get into that. But um, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and a big one, uh, we, at least we see uh, to add to that is, um, you know, vendors, you know, they're kind of a sub, sub form of an insider, but they, you know, they might not have the same training, the same motivation or same uh, wherewithal as someone within your organization. So they're, 
you know, under the gun, they're, uh, you know, they've got to catch a flight at, at four o'clock to go to the next customer site. And, you know, they might take a shortcut or they might, might forget to scan that removable media before they use it. So, uh, you know, between phishing and, and vendor uh, supply chain, that's, those are kind of the big two uh, ways. So those are things to certainly be aware of and think about um, what happens there. But, and, yeah, and just to piggyback on that, when do we see the incidents most often occur? Fridays, like by and large Fridays. And is that somebody that's like, hey, I'm getting ready for the weekend. I need to get these five things done. And they're going a little too fast. And we just need to slow them down a little bit and say, hey, take your time and, and make sure you're you're looking at things before you start going through and clearing out your inbox or anything like that. So um, definitely some things to, to keep in mind. Cool. I'll uh, advance this here. Yeah. And so then when we look at potential impacts of a cyber attack against maritime OT, all of these things can occur. Um, when we look at the organizational impacts, um, that can place, cybersecurity has become a business and organizational challenge, right? And so it's not just the IT team, the ops team, it's across the organization on how that can impact things um, <clears throat> both, you know, from a financial reputational impact, but then also customer service, customer success, all those types of things that there's an increased workload um, after if an event does occur with all of those stakeholders. And it's, it's stressing the entire organization, not just one specific team. And so working together as a team is, is critical. And we, when we look at the supply chain, both upstream and downstream uh, impacts to maritime stakeholders, where you might not be able to take that upstream delivery because your operations in, in the yard are at a standstill. And so they're trying to bring you additional goods and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold off right now. We can't take that. And then downstream, obviously, any type of supply chain deliveries that, that have been impacted, now they're on hold. Um, and you can't necessarily get those. So the whole system very quickly um, experiences some reverberations based on these. And you have the intermodal disruption. So not just maritime, but then obviously the ports as the gateways um, to several other sectors, whether it's rail, pipeline, um, as we've been seeing, and then also trucking and, and surface transportation, you know, that's, those are all coming together right in the port areas. And so we see a lot of those. And from a safety and security impact, you've got environmental and, and potential hazardous material incidents. And that can be whether that's from a container perspective, from a pipeline perspective, energy perspective in those port areas of what's taking place um, and the availability and integrity of what's going on. And, and so I think everybody is, is hyper aware of some of these things, given what occurred with um, the colonial pipeline attack that recently occurred. And, and so you saw that, okay, even if it impacts on the business side, um, and it might be the billing system that, that goes down, well, now everything else freezes. And so the availability of other systems comes into play. Um, and I think that was well documented and, and shared out recently over the last um five weeks or so as as we looked at that but then there's other controls there as well cctv is is often used to reduce the number of physical security personnel that are required on site to be able to to provide those access controls um, and monitoring of sensitive areas throughout terminals um, so these are all things that that can play a role both from a safety and security perspective perspective um, and so those are things to keep an eye on and, and, and Pete please feel free to jump in here as yeah as well. I really like the the safety and security aspect because as you know an OT practitioner uh, from long ago you know OT wasn't always safe but now we're we're hyper aware of PPE and uh, hyper aware of you know lockout tag out and process and safety and I really like tying cybersecurity in with the safety aspect because that's something uh, OT understands well. It's been well adopted. Uh, whenever there's a safety issue, there's 
there's never a question, even if it was, uh, you know, uh, someone overstepping or maybe being too safe, that's, they would rather have it be that way than, you know, someone have uh, an incident. So I really would like to see uh, cyber kind of dovetail into that same, same way OT adopted uh, safety. And of course, supply chain and organizational, those are uh, easy to understand, but a, a big thing in the organizational is uh, almost uh, every one of these ransomware attacks is gonna require uh, your company to either procure or uh, increase your cybersecurity insurance. So we're seeing, you know, premiums go up sevenfold, and you have to uh, involve multiple vendor vendors. Like you're being marked as uninsurable, which means you become unoperatable. Uh, and if a vessel was to land in your port, uh, it might be deemed unseaworthy to continue if if your port's been compromised. So there, it really does stretch out. Uh, pretty far-reaching stuff here. And one last thing on this slide, I think we saw last week, and, and folks might have paid attention to the Colonial Pipeline CEO's testimony in, in front of the Senate Committee um, Homeland Security last week, and he talked about the controller hitting that hitting that button to say, okay, yeah, we're we're going to shut down operations because of the potential safety issue, and so precisely to, to, to what you're saying there of, you know, that culture is, is ingrained and it's great. Um, and, and we're seeing now security dovetail and with that in, in some regards, and that's a positive thing, I, I believe. Yeah, me as well, Scott. Uh, so we'll move on a bit and we'll, we'll talk a bit about, you know, OT. We've kind of been throwing that word around here and we haven't really introduced it. Um, that's something that we use to describe operational technologies. So some of the some of the forgotten critical infrastructure that's out there. So the the things that are keeping you know uh, the LNG cool in your uh, in your port or the power systems that are responsible for for the grid, uh, you know PLCs that are controlling rail cars and, and switches getting out of the yard, uh, the cranes, the gantry cranes, and uh, building controllers and cameras. That's what we uh, talk about and when we mean OT. And, and there's some IT gear in there. You know you have some typical servers and workstations and HMI, but really this, this sort of gear is designed with uh, safety and availability in mind, but not necessarily uh, cybersecurity in mind out of the gate. So a lot of them run uh, insecure protocols or they're very sensitive to traditional uh, monitoring techniques and tactics where you, know, you might do a, a scan or a discovery and things that work very well in IT on you know, regular workstations that uh, you might be using or, or tablets or, you know, switches and routers and firewalls that you find in, in IT. They're all kind of well well rehearsed and getting scanned and, and poked and prodded. But uh, IT gear, uh, when you do some of that more uh, intrusive discovery and scanning, uh, we've seen things go wrong, you know, PLCs be uh, knocked offline or even as far as uh, breaking a device where you actually have to have a vendor uh, come out and actually restore that device or even replace it. So uh, it is sensitive. So that means you kind of have to take it uh, a very special tact when it comes to to dealing with security. Uh, so you have to work with your vendors and also kind of work within the framework of well, what's the what's the implication of monitoring this device? Does it impact availability? Is it uh, what's the right amount of data to collect? And we'll get into uh, a bit more on on that here. And then we get into standards, and Scott's going to kind of take us a bit through um, some of the standards that we're seeing, and and there'll certainly be more coming out uh, with some TSA directives and, and and more regulations in effect. All right. And so one of the things to I, I don't like to necessarily uh, suggest or recommend that folks take a compliance approach to cyber risk management, but a lot of folks and and senior leadership teams want to know, okay, what do we need to do? what is the absolute required now if you look at best practices and implement some of those you're going to chances are all of these things you know they're talking similar types of items um there are some specific differences but um you'll be hitting on all of these and you actually won't need to do a whole lot more to then become compliant and this is just some of the standards that, that are out there so touching real quickly on each of these 
last year, um, February, March, I want to say, um, the Coast Guard released a uh, navigation and vessel um, inspection circular 01-20, which says that by October 1st of this year, and no later than September 30th of last year, upon the annual inspection date, um, under MITSA requirements, there, there are requirements for computer and computer security. And the NAVIC calls out and says, okay, by that time, you really need to have um, completed a facility security assessment and updated your either your facility security plan or created a cyber annex to your facility security plan, your FSP, um, to, to address cyber risks um, that, that have been identified. Now, the NAVIC doesn't really get into a whole lot of detail. So some folks I know are kind of um, looking at the NAVIC and saying, okay, what's the NAVIC calling out? What's the Coast Guard going to look at? And there's a lot of um, what I consider fall under people cybersecurity controls. So do you have policies? Do you have um, procedures in place, et cetera? But it really doesn't get into the technical side at all and really doesn't name what needs to be done. So you won't see things like having any type of security architecture. Um, vulnerability management isn't called out. Scanning and, and things like this. And, and Pete just touched on, you know, okay, depending on how you do some of these things, you, you know, you're going to run into issues on the OT side. But the NAVIC doesn't really touch on a lot of those things that um, I think a lot of folks uh, in the cybersecurity field, whether on the IT or OT side, are going to say, well, these are some fundamental things that should be included. Um, making sure that you have asset management in place, configuration management types of things. And some of that is touched on in the NAVIC, but not necessarily to a robust nature, I would say. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind when it comes to, particularly when it comes to compliance, I'm going to separate compliance and standards a little bit here. When it comes to compliance for, for what the government's going to ask, that's really what they're looking at is like the minimum bar is like this is the least common denominator so don't think of that as like the end state and the and the goal to reach because um when we talk about those threat actors that most of you are concerned about 61 percent are concerned about a lot of those things are not going to keep those threat actors you know even close to being at bay and and you're not necessarily going to be able to protect against everything but you're you're really going to be uh still not countering those threat actors um, it, from a what, what would often be defined as an acceptable level by the senior leadership, you, you won't be there yet just looking at those. And then the standards, um, and, and before I get to that, the, the IMO um, is most likely later this year going to be looking to adopt some additional shore side cybersecurity guidelines for ports and ports facilities. Um, it, the file later on this year. And that's still still pending and, and coming up. But uh, I think everybody has kind of understood that a few years ago when the IMO previously discussed adopting uh, more standards in, in this regard, they weren't prepared yet. Um, we've seen a number of attacks take place since then, um, including last year on the IMO themselves. Um, and a number of, of maritime organizations and that, that's continuing this year. And so I think at this point, now that we have on the vessel side with IMO 2021, that that's in place, I think on, um, on the ISPA side, on the shore side, we are going to see that adoption. And there are some guidelines that are being presented to IMO over the summer for consideration. Um, and I think that those, those might very well um, come out. And those aren't going to be overly pres prescriptive, once again, because those tactics that techniques and procedures change very rapidly. But I think one of the, the things that is going to change is definitely requiring senior leadership, the executive leadership team, the head of organizations. And this is going, whether we look at GDPR on the privacy side of saying you have to have a name chief privacy officer, IMO is probably going to come out saying, okay, you need to have some sort of cybersecurity lead. And ultimately we're going to hold the senior leadership accountable. And Anissa with with um, port security guidelines for for European countries, similar types of things. The, there's more and more coming out. Now, in standards, you can also look at ISA and 62443 
and and from an OT security standpoint and all of that. And and so one of the things is what works well for your organization. What will be accepted by senior leadership? Work to those standards and whether that's NIST, whether that's ISO, whether it's ISA, um, whether that's looking at guidelines that are out there as best practices, figure out what that is tied to it and, and that's gonna help drive the organization forward. And as Pete said, we're gonna be seeing more from the government um, based on some of the, everything from solar winds through Colonial and, and everything that's happening. Um, there's definitely a lot of traction um, within the, the DC Beltway um, for additional uh, rules, guidelines, security, directives, executive orders, et cetera. Yeah, and, it, and certainly a journey. So, you know, one of the most mature uh, standards group that we've, you know, dealt with is, you know, NERC and FERC and the U.S. utilities where, you know, it started with suggestions and then it moved to enforcement and then it moved to, you know, enforcement uh, with fines. Uh, so certainly, you know, this doesn't move fast, but the quicker you as an organization can organize around uh, some best practices, you know, call them compliance or uh, cybersecurity or maturity. Um, you have to you have to start, and once once you get that start, it's something you can iterate on. Um, yeah, so it's it'll be an interesting journey, and we'll see uh, we'll see where the government goes. I think we have some great standards uh, already, like Scott mentioned, the NIST cybersecurity framework or NIST 800. Um, that's a really great one. You've got the CIS controls. You have the maritime specific ones we've we've talked about, uh, which is really a good warm up to uh, the next slide. So uh, compliance standards aside, if you look at most of the uh, compromises, it, it it boils down to uh, you know with Colonial it was a forgotten uh, legacy VPN system. Uh, if you look at you know old Smart, it was uh, yeah, we had some remote access software that maybe wasn't set up the best way or maybe even not even the right software that the company had standardized on. Uh, SolarWinds, you know, very sophisticated uh, supply chain attack. Uh, that's that's a tough one to protect against. So there you're really worrying about uh, spread once it actually uh, uh, penetrates through, in that case, the supply chain. But really, um, you know, you'll see a lot of marketing and, and hype around, you know, you need to have uh, uh, thread intel and and sock and that's those are excellent things to do and have but uh you really need to start uh foundational so you need to know where you know what you have what are your assets what are their vulnerabilities look like every piece of thread intel and event that comes into the sock needs that type of context so if the thread intel says you know we're having uh seeing attacks you know, from overseas on Siemens controllers. Well, if you don't know if you have Siemens controllers or not, that thread intel really isn't any good to you, right? So you really have to know what you have to really get to that highest level of uh, maturity. And it's not easy, right? It's, it's uh, if you're doing it manually, it's walk downs, it's, it's spreadsheets. If you're gonna employ some tools, you might do uh, some network scanning. You might even go as far as uh, active querying things, uh, but really the key is uh, automate as much as you can because as soon as you do your assessment, the more manual it is, the the quicker it is out of date. So if you're doing walkdowns and spreadsheets and uh, someone push, pushes patches or a vendor comes in and reconfigures, well, all those spreadsheets that you did yesterday are out of date because uh, you know Windows is chatty. Windows takes a lot of patches. Uh, PLCs are, are, are fairly quiet and but really knowing uh, where your vulnerabilities are, who's talking to who when you start to get into the network, you know, do I have networks uh, bridged together, things that are multi-homed, find those you know, pivot points that the attacker is looking for. Uh, having that data set is, is very, very important. And it really starts at the kind of foundation of this pyramid. Um, then when you kind of get up into phase two, we're starting to talk about Okay, now that you know your assets, what's what's normal for them? What's what's a normal user profile look like? Does that person log in once a day, twice a day? If you start to see logins at night or outside of uh, the norm, uh, should you be concerned? Uh, you start to look at attack surface where, okay, well maybe you have vendor remote access turned on for certain certain amounts of time. 
uh, let's make sure that those are turned off in a timely manner and uh, really just getting a good understanding of that before you can get into the uh, holistic uh, story of the environment. Um, I don't know anything else on the, the best practices, but really it's about uncovering those unknowns. And that's it's not an easy task, but it's it's really the best place to start. Every standard says asset inventory, asset inventory, asset inventory. That's like the first, uh, if not before, the first thing you need to do in all of them. So, and that's something we definitely believe in. And definitely then being able to tie back in and who has access to those assets. You know, and, and that gets into some of the more advanced things when, when we're talking about shifting more towards zero trust architecture because there's so many stakeholders that either have remote access, um, whether that's a vendor providing remote maintenance be, to cut down on travel costs, um, speed up capabilities, serve, you know, they don't have enough service workers and so that they're trying to serve multiple clients more quickly. All these things kind of play play back to those assets that, that he's talking about. Right. And that's a good segue to, you know, what are the approaches for gathering this asset base? So, you know, most of our customers, their their general concern is, you know, my day-to-day -day operations are running the plant, running the, the port, making sure the product that we sell, generate is is online. So help me understand what do I need to do to instrument and how do I become uh, efficient at this and this is where we start to talk about um, the different types of data collection and what uh, makes sense where so there's lots of different technologies out there and it really breaks down into four specific uh, types of data collection so one uh, that we kind of classify as agents so this is where there's a piece of software that actually sits uh, on an asset it might be something that has an operating system uh, it gives you really the best amount of data resolution uh, you know, real-time updates as to what's changing, uh, easy to manage, easy to update, uh, but it does require you to physically install something, right? So now that might mean uh, getting different uh, owners within the business involved, maybe getting vendors permission to, you know, open up boxes that are meant to be, you know, a black box or not touched. Um, but those really give you the best resolution and can provide kind of the best bit of uh, robustness so especially when you're looking at things like vulnerabilities or what ports you have open uh, what ports are kind of latently sitting there listening those are things where you know a quick flyby scan isn't going to tell you uh kind of that level of detail which certainly those you know flyby scans are are great places to start and we'll talk about those in a bit but they're not they don't provide the depth you need to answer some of those maturity questions um, the second bit is around when we do agentless or a native query or we call this a kind of remote data collection uh, it's pretty close in resolution to to something that's installed natively you know reaching out via say an ssh or a, a native uh, siemens or profinet protocol gathering up the basics from information uh, very easy to manage uh, can be all done from a centralized location provided that uh, central location has routing and access to all those things um, but that is one con where you do you do need to have routable connections to to find everything, and then you know you do need to to know the device's credentials. Uh, but again, really great at giving you uh, security resolution to things like vulnerabilities, uh, patches, and things like that. As we move forward to kind of some of the less uh, intrusive thing, less intrusive items, uh, a network monitoring based approach, which is you know very very popular these days. Uh, certainly a great starting point, you know, if you have uh, infrastructure to support it, you've got switches that are modern with span ports or taps or, or mirror ports, you can quickly get uh, kind of a jump start on your asset inventory by just discovering what's out there. So you quickly get, you know, a list of uh, Macs and IPs, you might be able to know what ports they, you know, regularly communicate on, but you don't know kind of what's latent, you won't be able to tell, you know, versions or, or what what version of windows or linux or uh, plc firmware you might be able to kind of negotiate out of some of that traffic um, but again it is kind of onerous to potentially set up especially if your uh, environment isn't modern you don't have extra switch or span or tap ports and it really is kind of a, a starting point it it's not enough 
to know you know the max and ips on your network you need to know a little bit more about your assets so it's not really comprehensive but it's uh an amazing starting point you'll learn more in that step of your kind of asset inventory journey than really any other one because this is where we get the typical aha moments where oh you found a control system that i thought was decommissioned that is still connected or yeah that plant is still uh, online and we're still uh we're, we're still dual feeding information because we're not ready to turn the backup system off and this is where you find those unknown vpns or unknown pieces of data and connections which is fun and then lastly offline collection which is something that we kind of pioneered uh, long ago when we were um, helping some of our uh, utilities customers uh, using you know serial devices or things that sat behind air gaps where we were able to do clever things like gather uh, configuration files or even take in oh you already have you know a homegrown database that's being fed information from uh, homegrown collection scripts. Uh, terrific, we'll, we'll take that in and put it into a framework that's repeatable, understandable, and that you can you know, do things like uh, anomaly detection and changes. Uh, but as we mentioned earlier, it's really, um, really only as good as the last time you did your, your walking around and gathered your files or for information. Um, so now that we've kind of gone through that, we wanna actually take uh, another poll here to query the audience on you know what sort of technologies and techniques have uh, you employed if if any uh, in your environments for uh, data gathering about asset inventory so the first question is going to be around you know what collections more or less have you heard of or or seen in your IT environment and then the second question will be um, are you using any of these technologies uh, on the OT side of the house yet um, so Paula will we'll get those up here hopefully and give us some results in about a minute or so. Which I think we did. Okay, it looks like we're not getting any more votes. So I'm gonna go ahead and close it. Perfect. We'll share. There's your results. And maybe Scott can help me because I still can't seem to see the results even when you share so, them. Okay, so I'm seeing network monitoring, 68%, agents, 18%, offline collection, and none of these both at 7%, agent lists, zero percent okay so a mix of uh some of the passive network monitoring and and agents so that's uh that's great so that's uh you're using it sounds like folks are using uh, some of the right steps to do that initial discovery and then you know moving into agents when uh when they find things that it makes sense to use agents on so that's great um now our next question is around uh are you using any of these same methods in in ot I think we've got about as many votes as we're going to get, so I'll close it. Perfect. And how did Fair. we do? Fair, fairly close. The no is the majority at 57%. Yes is 43%. But getting close to that split. Yeah, so a little, probably a little more adoption than I would have uh, guessed for this this market. So that's really great to see. Uh, so with that, we're going to touch on a few uh, other items here in the mix. Um, but really, kind of in summary, what uh, what else is important? We talked about that that baseline of understanding. You know, what are my assets? Where are they? What are they connected to? Um, you know, who to reach out to when you see an issue or a problem with them. But uh, the first question you want to answer once you have this this great inventory data is 
you know, what are my threat vectors? Uh, what, where are my vulnerabilities? Which ones uh, can I mitigate? Which ones are, uh, which ones even apply to me? So you, you end up in a vulnerability workflow where you've, you make decision criteria and you take a look at what matters and it really helps folks prioritize um, their cybersecurity efforts going forward. So if you know your assets and you know the ones that are critical to your business, those are the ones you focus on securing or closing uh, holes in first as opposed to you know trying to boil the ocean with every single vulnerability on the planet because that will uh, that gets overwhelming really fast. So having the decision criteria of okay the assets that secure my perimeter or the assets that might bridge networks, you start to prioritize those and and you kind of jump into that. Uh, then as we talked about, you, you you move into kind of the top of that pyramid where you're uh, working on threat detection and threat intel, and now you're able to marry uh, that data you're seeing from uh, feeds against what your real-world environment looks like. Uh, but as I mentioned, those feeds are, are only as good as the data uh, that you can kind of compare it against. So really important to have that uh, asset visibility and then compare it with those feeds. And then as we touched on, um, getting visibility of uh, the third parties that are in your environment. So we see lots of compromises come in, you know, accidentally through vendors or remote access left on for vendors, uh, really getting visibility to their process. So monitoring uh, what they're bringing in, what they're bringing out. If they're using things like removable media, make sure they're uh, scanning it, making sure that they're able to use, uh, you know, loaner PCs versus bringing their own. Uh, checking to make sure that the repositories that uh, holds the third-party data is actually genuine and not you know, like a watering hole attack. So really looking at those uh, bits and bytes that they're bringing into your environment and you know take those extra few minutes to to do that qualification because it might, uh, though you might have to stay late on a Friday, it might not, uh, uh, if you don't do those checks, it might ruin the whole weekend for you being back into work. So. Um, and then pick a standard, right? So we talked a lot about standards. Um, there's lots of great ones. Uh, pick one and figure out how to uh, make reporting as painless as possible, right? So as the, the market matures, you will start to be asked for uh, proof that you are running a security program or proof that you've done whatever standards are being enforced. The sooner you come up with a strategy for reporting, uh, that data either outbound to your organization or third-party auditors of the government. Uh, we really like to get it on kind of an automatic mode where, okay, if, if your operators are doing the right things, the reports essentially run and prove that they're doing the right things and you tuck them away for uh, whatever rainy day that you're, uh, you're asked for. And then third-party integration uh, we're seeing as a huge trend in cyber right now. So um, we have IT and OT, uh, there's certainly always that divide there, but they are starting to work together. Uh, the OT vendors are getting more friendly on integration and letting their OT-specific data, you know, run northbound to uh, SIMs and, and things like Splunks. You'll see uh, even things like just ServiceNow had released very recently an OT plugin. So we're seeing lots more adoption and acceptance of, uh, of OT data and really understanding uh, that you have to bridge that gap. There is no, um, you know, there is always going to be some form of a divide, but we have to get to a point where we can information share on cybersecurity, um, you know, bi-directionally there, which is important. Um, so I know most folks will like to start with uh, basics, which is which is excellent, but you've got to really go beyond the basics of, you know, firewalls and antivirus. They're certainly good, but uh, you know, firewalls get modified, their rules change, someone, you know, writes a rule to allow something that was supposed to be temporarily for a vendor maintenance activity or a, or a project, uh, and then that rule never gets turned off, and that ultimately is the thing that uh, that compromises you, or, you know, you've, you've deployed antivirus, but you couldn't deploy it on a few machines, or you had to deploy it, uh, you know, again, we'll pick on Siemens, on a Siemens, a computer, but we had to ignore a bunch of directories because the, the definitions were matching uh, lots of unknown files. So you're, although you installed the, the AV engine, you had to put in a lot of uh, ignore rules to get it to be satisfied or uh, the endpoint didn't have enough 
you know, CPU and RAM to, to handle the modern antivirus that you've, uh, you've spec'd out as a company. So it ends up having to, uh, to be skipped. So this is really where uh, monitoring becomes your best, uh, your best friend. So you can't uh, protect all of OT because of its age or its criticality, but you can certainly uh, monitor it in many of the safe ways that we talked about it. I think that's one of the, the key points there is, you know, OT is, is, was built to last for quite a while and run in environments for quite a while. And so the aging of equipment and still being able to monitor so you can determine if something's there because you might not be able to patch with the frequency um, that you can on the IT side. You, uh, it's, one, it's just not feasible. It, it, it's not possible because um, of how things were, were designed. Um, but having some sort of visibility and like last year what we saw from july till january of this year was a heavy emotet campaign targeting third parties um, in the maritime environments and and then trying to use those to hijack and and then uh, pivot into other trusted stakeholders um, impersonating that third party and picking up on a from a compromised email account a real email thread that had occurred and just adding in, oh, I just updated these documents, please take a look. Um, and you see that it's come from a somebody that's in your contact list and you've communicated with. And so it becomes very difficult. Yeah, that's, that's some good advice, Scott. Um, so we're getting towards the end. I think we've got one more uh, kind of wrap up slide uh, to talk about before we get into the, the Q&A portion. And so when we look at this, you know, once again, um, try to manage the risk, not just people, not just process, not just technology, it, it's everything together. Um, and it is really now an organizational challenge, um, but have a cybersecurity lead. And that person, you know, with a lot of what we see within the maritime stakeholder environment, there are some small organizations um, and they might not have dedicated cybersecurity folks inside. Others have very large teams, hundreds of people. Um, it really varies from organization to organization, but somebody really needs to be the lead in there um, and they need to work with all of the business elements um, and, and really map that strategy across what is the business trying to do? What are some of those improvements and integrations that they're working on? Because it's gonna facilitate business, it's gonna add additional capabilities, et cetera, that, that, that's all got to be seamless. Um, and then, you know, Pete, with the, with the hygiene, I know you've got a lot of thoughts on what to look for there. Yeah, yeah, and certainly uh, part of the organizational maturity is to say that, you know what, that's not our, that's not our core competency. We don't understand it. Uh, the amount of ramp up time uh, to become an expert might, might be too long and it might be easier, faster, better, more effective, more cost worthy to uh, just find your expert. And you know what, whether that's a contractor, whether that's a company, whether that's a partner, just taking that first step of saying, looking around and being honest about your, your organization's capabilities and saying, you know, this, we're not gonna get there with what we have. And if we're gonna open up budget, uh, you know, we might hire a security expert, but you know what's gonna happen that person happens to have networking skills or uh, you know programming skills and they're quickly going to be co-opted into whatever the most important project is for you know that day and cybersecurity is going to get lost so um, definitely take that first step and you know cyber hygiene it's certainly um, something that's very near and dear to my heart and lots of debate about it but certainly there's no shortage of proof where if you take the you know, the five core steps of, you know, knowing your assets, understanding who they're talking to, uh, you know, knowing what your networks are, finishing the, the, you know, the real basic things that any standard says, you reduce your risk by a very dramatic amount. So if you just go and just pick on like the CIS controls, if you follow the top CIS controls, uh, CIS themselves says, you're gonna reduce your risk of an incident by 85%. Uh, and that's just the real basics of knowing what you have and and who's out there. Um, and then from there, it then it becomes, okay, let's work on the advanced use cases of 
uh, detecting anomalies, threat hunting, and you know maybe you pull in uh, machine learning because now you've got you know lots of data flowing in, uh, and you need to understand uh, what's real and what's reality. Um, and then as we get into kind of third party uh, and vendors, as we've we've you know picked on those guys a bit, but really we're seeing some new uh, push across the industries of getting vendors to push uh, and publish SBOM, so software builds the material. Uh, you know, that's great. That finally gives you the ability to, uh, when a vendor shows up on site or a vendor provides you something, that gives you a cross-reference cross of, again, okay, this, this PLC update, here's the bomb for it. It contains these packages and these are the checksums and you can quickly do a, a sanity check against uh, their website uh, to know that you truly have the right thing. And then third-party maintenance, right? So there's lots of uh, lots of intrigue there, and we need to make sure we're uh, not only just monitoring it, but you know, really uh, working with your vendors hand in glove to understand what their processes are like. Um, and then lastly, information sharing. So we've got, uh, you know, Scott's group, the ISAC can certainly help. Um, and you know, talk to your peers, talk, share what you're share what you're seeing. Uh, all that really helps you get to that uh, risk reduction state. Uh, but again, that very first step of just understanding uh, your posture and taking that first step of understanding your assets is really uh, core to any maturity that you're going to achieve kind of down the road. Yeah, and and as a as a great example of that just occurred over this past weekend. And was, over the weekend, a lot of people are are away from from the workplace. But there was a stakeholder who very quickly started sharing information with their peers about a third party that was mutual across the community and letting them know, hey, there might be an issue here. And, and so everybody kind of quickly um, knew about that as opposed to allowing, you know, a, again, a potential threat actor, which you guys are concerned about, be able to pivot across multiple organizations and really impact that supply chain. So that quick, actionable information sharing is going to be key moving forward. Because again, what we've seen from the attack cycles is these threat actors are very active and um, it, it is a daily grind um, trying to, to make sure that this stuff is, our supply chains are, are operational. Yeah, that's some great stuff. I know we did have, um... Uh, a couple questions come in. Uh, so one was, uh, which of the standards that were mentioned do you believe will be most applicable applicable to the ports, specifically U.S. ports? So maybe we'll have Scott uh, Scott tackle that one. Um, so specific when we look at the U.S. ports, one of the ones that that or at least the frameworks that are being most widely adopted um, falls under NIST. Um, and a lot of those are 800-171 specifically that, that are being looked at as a requirement that U.S. Transcom has, and a lot of ports have some sort of relationship there. Um, and then that's also being kind of leveraged with CMMC going forward is, is, is kind of the, the first gateway. So I think NIST-based um, is definitely there. And if you're looking for port security grant program money, I think, again, I, I know a lot of folks are, are now aware of this, but if you want that grant money, if you're not using a NIST framework, then FEMA and the, that grant program are going to deny the request. They wanna see it tied back to a NIST framework. So for that reason, um, that's gonna be one of the most popular ones. Yeah, and certainly, um we see NIST as kind of one of the standouts. It's been used successfully, you know, in the nuclear space. It's been used. Uh, it was probably the, a lot of the basis for some of the NERC standards that came out before they were really tailored to utilities. We see a lot of uh, interest in in uh, you like oil and gas. You'll see, you know, NIST CSF being the standard. So the government has, you know, already invested quite a bit in some quality frameworks and some quality standard sets. So we probably won't uh, see something totally new, but it'll be a variant, you know, a maritime or a port variant of something that looks very, very familiar. 
um, which is good. It keeps everyone across industries and verticals doing approximately the same thing, which is good. Uh, we did have another question that, that is, do you believe the TSA security directive will affect port cybersecurity directly? So yeah, I think a big resounding yes there. Uh, specifically, uh, my, my take is there's going to be uh, more prescriptive guidance, whether in the form of standards or bulletins or whatever it might be. Because uh, right now, even as the, uh, uh, you know, the CEO of Colonial testified, uh, they had put off their, their TSA uh, checkpoint or review, um, which, you know, not great, but it, it ultimately came out and I wholeheartedly agree that you know, doing a paper-based cybersecurity exercise isn't wouldn't have changed the game here. It wouldn't have changed the outcome of Colonial. Let's say they did that, you know, six months ago, they would have filled it out to the best of their ability. Nothing on that paperwork says, you know, do you do you know about unknown VPNs or or you know that we need some prescriptive uh, guidance and advice, and then you know enforcement can potentially come. But I don't think. I don't think it's fair to have enforcement without some sort of, uh, as Scott mentioned, funding or business uh, assistance to 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 get people to invest, right? Because it's it's asking too much of an organization to stand up a cyber practice with with no due budget, and yeah, you can't raise uh, tariffs, you can't raise gas prices, you can't add additional things. That's it can't it has to come from somewhere, right? So the government has to be flexible on assistance or uh, guidance. So at least that's my thought. Um, so those are the two questions that came in. Paula, did you see any other ones that came in through um, chat that we may have missed? I don't think I saw any other ones. I see one more. Um, have you seen IEC 62443 applied in the ports? Yes. Um, and, and particularly when you look at some of the energy ports, um, that is one that that gets looked at more often. Again, a little bit more maturity with the energy sector than, say, from a container shipping perspective. Um, but 62443 ha has been applied. Yeah, we definitely see it in oil, for sure. Any uh, Anyone that's touching oil or involved with oil is, as there's a 62443 component, especially, probably more... Uh, internationally than in the U.S. Uh, currently, but depending upon how we, we go. And again, that's a great standard as well, but if you look at uh, the asset inventory portion, it's it's pretty much the same recommendations on, you know, segmenting and securing and, uh, you know, they're, they're fair famous for the Purdue model way back, right? So that's uh, uh, all kind of part and parcel to what all these industries, you know, same same vendors, same same problems. Uh, so, well, I think that's it for questions. Um, thank you, Pete and Scott, for that very insightful presentation. I hope all of our attendees feel like you gained some insightful insights. Um, before you sign off, I hope you'll hang in just a couple of minutes so I can share some upcoming events and promotions that we have that I think may interest you. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick here, so I'm going to steal the screen from you, Pete. Here we go. And you should be able to see my screen now, right? So our next webinar is going to be um, hosted by the ABS group on how to comply with approaching U.S. Coast Guard cybersecurity regulations. I know you touched on it a little bit um, today, Pete and Scott. Um, that'll be on July 1st, uh, 2021, so just a couple weeks from today at 12 noon. And then our um, annual convention, as I mentioned, we're going to be holding in-person events. Um, that's going to be September 26th through the 29th in Austin, Texas. We're very excited to be seeing people in person. Um, we have some booths available if you're interested in exhibiting. Um, we only have a couple of premium booth spots left. So um, if you're interested in a premium booth spot, you might want to snag that up before it goes. Um, and then we've got some other events. Uh, 
coming up as well. Um, our cruise seminar, that's a virtual event, is coming up, I believe that's next week. Um, our marine terminal management training is coming up. That's part of our PPM program if you're looking to get certified. Um, our port security seminar and expo will be July 14th through the 16th in New York City. Um, there's also, also um, that's a hybrid event. So if you're not comfortable traveling or able to travel, um, there is a virtual component to that. Um, our facilities engineering seminar and expo is in November in Savannah, Georgia. We have our executive management conference in November, our commissioner seminar in December, and then our Latin Congress coming up as well. We have a new mobile app that we just launched last month. Um, it's available for iOS and Android users. We've got news and Twitter feeds, in-app messaging, our smart guide. So if you're looking to connect and find contacts to our members um, and network with them, we've got networking forums. So you can form little groups to connect with each other. Um, event information is posted on there. You do need to have your member ID and login um, available to to use it to access it um, so if you don't know or have your member id um, and login you can contact my colleague renita gross um, and her email address is right there for you rgross at aapa-ports.org and then if you're interested like i said in hosting a member webinar or if you aren't a member and you're interested in becoming a member please feel free to contact me. My name again is Paula Gonzalez. My email address is here for you and my phone number is posted here for you as well. Um, and it, uh, even if it's not for a webinar or membership, if you have a question about any of our programs, events or services, I'm always happy to help. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. So this concludes our program for today. Thank you so much again to Pete and Scott. Um, I appreciate your your expertise, sharing your expertise with us today. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, thank you again for your attention today to our attendees. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care and have a great day. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.